Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 58 of our podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you're enjoying it. And while this particular tale may be coming to an end, don't worry, we have another one in the works. Maybe it's about what happens if a lady in waiting wants to leave the court and be on the stage Mm. to speak the speech. So join us as we talk about the history and entertain you with a story that might have happened. We like that. And support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the Shop Now button. It's looking fantastic. You can get a Do You Tudor tee or a Tudor Time Machine logo sweatshirt, and you can support the podcast at the same time. Now, in our last episode, we were in 1536 with Margaret Wyatt and Anne Boleyn. For that tragic tale of Anne and the Tower. Yes, but now we're back in Philomena's Inn as she ponders Blackjack's fate. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history behind our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 58, The Arundel Inn, in which two servants change their mistress's mind. Marianne, what distracts you so? Philomena asked as she looked in the glass and saw that the girl had arranged her hair like the leaning tower of Pisa. Placing both hands on it, she tried to push it upright, then cocked her head to the side. It requires balance. Oh, mistress, I will do it over. Marianne scolded herself under her breath as she pulled out pins and ribbons. What troubles you, Marianne? Forgive me, lady. I do not want to go against your wishes, rambled Marianne, her brows knitted. You do not want to arrange my hair? No, mistress, I do not want to marry a jailer. Whom? The jailer, mistress, from the poultry compter. So the feather-headed jailer remembered her conversation with him and was annoying pretty Mary Ann. A waste of his time. He should be busy with his prisoners and his chickens. He is a persistent rot, Mary Ann. Send him packing with my blessing. Ease returned to Mary Ann's movements. A knock turned Philomena's attention to the door, where the tower stood, head bowed. She was on her feet in a flash. Mistress! cried Marianne, as Philomena's hair fell about her shoulders. What word have you to bring, my lad? Has Constance made her way? Do she and Charles sail for Spain? I beg your patience when I tell you they do not. The Princess Cecilia was at Dover, and Mistress Stonna chose instead to be a lady to that princess. Philomena laughed. I could not have imagined such news. Better than to be dreamed of. Yet Sir Charles Paget let her go? He did not insist? The tower looked to the ceiling and then opined. On the way, Sir Charles learned many truths about the mistress and decided she would find greater happiness in the Swedish court. Philomena studied the tower's face. She could not pull and wrench the story from him. She might never know how it spun out, and yet she was too joyful to care. Some jolly Swede would adore Constance, and she would learn Swedish and a new dance or two. Tower, you have done me ten services in this one. She saw a flicker on the tower's face. Is there something else? At Gravesend, we were met by Sir John Norris. A little knot formed in Philomena's middle. Blackjack, indeed? The gentleman thought I travelled with you, lady. He believed you shrunken and ill. Oh, poor Sir John, Marianne sighed. He discovered Mistress Stona. He is a soldier, a man of duty, the tower intoned. What respect we bear him for that, Philomena waited. Sir John drew his sword, and I drew mine. Blackjack was dead, Philomena thought, dead at her command. She could not blame the dutiful tower. This was on her soul. God rot it. She should have ordered no blood be spilt. Yet she could never have imagined that Blackjack would be at Gravesend. It could not turn this way. Tower, my lad, did you kill Sir John? No, lady. I swiped my sword. He stopped it. He thrust. He stood just as this. The tower posed. Tower, for pity's sake, tell me what passed. Sir John lowered his weapon, lady. He spoke with the mistress Stonna. He let us go our way. 
But why? What did you say? What did Mistress Constance say? What did Sir John say? He let us go. Mistress, I must attend the horses. Can you tell me no more? Mistress, I must attend the horses. Oh, very well. You may go. Philomena sat down, her head in her hands, and her mind confounded. Sir John let them pass because of his love for you, mistress, Marianne said. That is untrue. Mistress, forgive me for saying it, but you wish it was true. My hair awaits, Marianne. But as they returned to their positions at Philomena's dressing table, Marianne clucked several times. Do not make that noise, Marianne. You sound like an old hen. I beg pardon. I am sure I am mistaken, but I believed you thought on Sir John. I have seen you standing in his room. Philomena flushed. The observant servant, a blessing and a curse. Have you no better pursuits, my girl, than spying? Oh, fie on it. What would you have me do? Chase him? Hunt him down? His brother, Sir William, was here, was he not? Wanting to reclaim his rooms? Could you not ask Sir John if he would like the same? I march into another inn and ask if a very wealthy guest would not prefer to live under my roof? Sir John would, indeed, prefer it. Tis true. You need not be lovers because he stays. A sensible observation, Philomena thought. Marianne was practical. A failed love affair was no reason for the man not to have comfortable rooms. Indeed, I need not. And I should do him the favour of offering his rooms to him when he has done me so great a favour. She wrote to Blackjack and dispatched the letter straight away. After dinner, she glided into the hall, ready to host the arrival of evening guests. Cuthbert stopped her, begging her pardon, and requesting her inspect the room on the ground floor arranged for Sir Ralph. Pleased by the mighty bed, she praised Cuthbert. There was a guest in the hall. It was he, Blackjack, his compact form tearing his cloak off, the crow-wing hair sticking about. Drawing herself up, she glided over with nonchalance. Sir John. You received my note. How she liked to be near him. How he radiated life. His smell. She tried to look mildly disinterested. Mistress Philomena, I did. He resented it so profoundly. Philomena acting the polite, detached hostess. But he found he understood her. She did not know why he had come. And she was so very proud. I would be fortunate to lodge here again. Sir, I believe that a truth. I shall show you the rooms. He bowed. I beg you take my arm. The way is steep. She placed her fingers on his forearm. How does your poor mother? Much the same, sir. Somewhere between life and death. I pray God she will recover soon. You are kind. He turned his warm look on her and she fluttered. His eyes overflowed with, Dear God, was that compassion? Philomena thought. It made a lump in her throat burn. She looked toward the landing at the top of the stairs. Philomena. The room is yet another flight, she silenced him. Twisted feelings, hesitation and thrill. She stopped at the open door of his former room. You have changed the cover on the bed, he observed. Do you find beauty in it, sir? I do, lady. It is the myth of Cupid and Psyche. I see it. She holds up the candle, revealing him. It is a tale of true love that could not find its way. Indeed, Philomena answered, searching for something worth saying. He walked into his chamber, glancing about, a critical look on his face. Mistress Arundel, in your note you wrote of a favour I had done you. You know it, sir. You let Constance go. A wholly unexpected act, Philomena considered it. How surprised Constance must have been. Blackjack never had a kind word for her. You miss your friend. Why should I not? Blackjack's heart thumped. Surely it was not fair-mindedness that brought her to write to him. And now you show me these rooms here as recompense? Did you compel the tower to tell me? Blackjack bristled. You know I did not. Am I to believe you did it from mercy? Have you such mercy in your heart, Philomena? What did he ask? Did she have the mercy to forgive him? Or did he make a reference to her faith? Which way did his mind run? Oh, Blackjack, to live with you is a torture, and to live without you is bleak, she said. Such words, he thought. Her life without him bleak? What could be more wonderful to hear? Yet he must not jump on it like a puppy. If I were not hard-hearted, how could I show you my better self? He asked. I believe I have seen your best, 
She heard her cross voice and winced. And so you think there is not more worth seeing? Philomena bit her lip. I cannot know. Fair lady, is not your curiosity there? I am brave, sir. I dare to hope you might show yourself well. He walked closer to her. I am in awe of your fortitude. His restraint brought his voice quiet, his eyes downcast. What would you venture, sir? I would venture a kiss. You shall have it. Lifting her chin, her lips met his soft mouth, his bristly beard, two soft kisses. Your lips tell true, Philomena. You have thought on me. Kinder things than I would admit. He wrapped her tight and bounced on his heels. Philomena. Philomena is lying to herself, but isn't that the way it is? But I don't care when in fact she does. Of course she does. And she's hiding behind practicality that Blackjack is good for business. And it's simply practical for her to encourage him to stay at her inn. Everyone wants their business to be <laughs> successful in London. It's an interesting time in England. Because things are changing in England's economic development. It's not all agriculture and taxes because traders are behaving in a way we would think of as the way finance bros behave today. And there's one particular merchant, Thomas Gresham, who is at the forefront of this new way. He worked his way up in the Mercer's company. Did he work his way up? He was more or less born to it, right? And his family were wealthy merchants. He went to Cambridge. He was apprenticed to his uncle, who was a Mercer. Well, that's true. <laughs> he was able to take the luck of his birth, yes. the era he was born in, and his own fierce negotiating abilities, and moved to the top of the company. Yes, and he also married a rich widow so that he would have the money to finance his ambitions. That is also <laughs> true. So it wasn't his own money. He was already a wealthy person. He had connections. Many things came together to enable him to be the man he was to become. Still, he took a position in the Mercer's company and really transformed it. And actually, he changed London as well. That's true. He built something very different than his uncle, who was a more traditional Mercer. The Mercer's company was one of the most important in England. And it was also one of the oldest. It was incorporated in 1394. Mm. And essentially, it was a trade association for general merchants, but especially for exporters of wool and importers of velvet, silk, and other luxury fabrics. Those were the actual Mercers that the name came from. So by the time of our story, the Mercers still trade in luxury goods, but it's not such a big part of their business. They were interested in providing money for business ventures and also currency trading. That was where the real money was. England was trading all over the world. They traded with Morocco, with the Ottoman Empire, all over Europe, and it was worldwide. And the Mercer's Company expanded along every single trade route. Antwerp was the hub of banking at this time. And the Germans and the Italians, they were the movers and shakers. And Gresham got himself over to Antwerp so he could be in the thick of it. He went 120 times in 30 years. True. I mean, now, of course, it doesn't seem so amazing because London to Antwerp takes only about three hours and 17 minutes on the Eurostar or even less if you're flying. It's 421 miles or 388 kilometers. But then it was a very arduous trip then. Let's think about it. Elizabeth never left England. And this guy went to Antwerp 120 times. He really had the will to do it. He was an incredibly driven person. Mm -hmm. And he was actually the first Englishman to kind of enter this fray with the Italians and the Germans. And he did, as Jesse said, he did a lot of what we now call currency trading. And he also did investment predictions, along with several other things and regular import export as well. I mean, then is now he wanted to stay ahead of his competitors. And he created a business spy network that would signal to him the kind of trade that was happening. That's right. So if all the sheep died, or if the ship sank, or if crops failed, Gresham would be the first to know. And then he would buy 
or sell in the market as was appropriate for him to make money. It's really incredible how successful he was at getting the jump on other investors. This network he had must have been incredible. Yes. And apparently he was really good at driving down a currency price because of information and then buying again and driving it up. Isn't that called insider trading? It's a little shady, huh? I think it was, but I don't think there were laws about what you were allowed to do at that time. Things are pretty mushy. And at this point, I think it's way too early for them to be regulating. Any kind of regulation, right? He was amazingly good at it. And supposedly it was Gresham's spy network that Elizabeth the first spy master, Francis Walsingham, took over. And it became his famous spy network to hunt down whomever Walsingham considered a threat to the English throne, which is pretty unbelievable that this spy network began with a way that somebody put it together to make money. But actually, that makes sense, because usually that's how things come about when people can make money on them. Then is now, right? It's almost like a private public partnership. The governmental enterprise took over that infrastructure. Gresham was considered a sort of government lackey. And your power, even if you were rich, depended on being on the king or queen's good side. That's true. Gresham knew that ultimately the monarchy was the only game in town. He was an agent for Henry VIII, and then he pitched himself to Edward VI to be Edward VI's governmental banker in 1547, and Edward took him on. Like Cecil, Gresham survived through Protestant Edward, Catholic Mary, and Middle Way Elizabeth, actually as a lot of people did. There were people who just stayed in through all those governments. Sort of civil servants. But actually, he didn't do that because he was such a fair dealer. No, apparently he was a very brutal guy. He would extort and bully and threaten physical violence to get a good rate for a loan. <laughs> it's like... So- I think Elizabeth approved of that. Because she could pinch a penny? Because she was frugal and she wanted to pay as little as possible in interest. Oh, I which agree. is only practical to run a healthy country. In the beginning, Gresham was smart about making a big deal of Elizabeth. There's a story that as soon as he learned that Mary was on her deathbed, he galloped and sailed and galloped as fast as he could from Antwerp to Hatfield House in Hertfordshire to arrive splattered with mud and desperate to meet the young Queen Elizabeth and offer his service to her. Such a scene. I can imagine she approved of that. She loved a dramatic show. She did. And she had him continue in his role as a governmental banker. And they worked together for many, many, many years. And he was close to Cecil. And he lent money to Robert Dudley, who always seemed to be in need of money. Gresham had a plan to restore the value of the currency after it was debased under Henry VIII. There's, in fact, a saying called Gresham's Law, which is that bad money drives out good. So you can't have some good money and some bad money. It has to all be good. And he started trying to restore the currency under Edward and Mary, but it was under Elizabeth that it really happened. And I wonder whether that was because the time was right or she had the right people around her, whether possibly she understood the values of that policy more or whether she simply was there long enough. But whatever the case, the economic work she did with Gresham on revaluing the currency really, really strengthened England and helped it go into this prosperous stage. When the money got very devalued, people in Europe didn't want to accept it. Right. There was a point, I think we've talked about this in another episode, where they really wouldn't accept English money. They wanted gold instead. So whatever Elizabeth thought of Gresham, she did not show her appreciation to him with money or land grant. Both Edward and Mary were more generous to Gresham than Elizabeth. Apparently, he actually told her she wasn't generous. He did not. He did. He wrote in a letter that he deserved land grants and money because, and I'm quoting now, you, that is Queen Elizabeth, shall find that I have done your highness other manner of service, both of greater importance and of greater mass and charge in all manner of ways than I have done to your late brother and sister, 
put both their charge together. Wow. <laughs> so I've done more for you than both your brother and sister stuck together. I mean, he was telling her how he saw it. And I'm telling you, she definitely did not like that. Oh. He thought his wealth should give him the prerogative to speak his mind, to be taken seriously. But to Elizabeth, he was a merchant and he was being fresh when he questioned her. And she did not believe she was bound to appreciate him. She was the queen after all. Right. And I'm sure she thought you've made so much money. How can you possibly complain about anything? Because of course, to do all these things, he needed her okay. He wasn't able to do anything without her okay. It was just a different system. But he had a mighty ego too. And he wanted to be praised and appreciated by Elizabeth. And it didn't happen. I mean, Elizabeth never gave him the kind of praise and money he thought he deserved. And that made him mad or maybe just sullen because of course he kept working for her. She was the only game in town. But they began to simply have a kind of a cold war between them. Well, actually, they needed each other. She could see his talent. And we can't make it seem as if he was struggling. No. <laughs> he was rich, rich, rich. And he just wanted to be rich, rich, richer. He built Gresham House, a huge, beautiful residence. And that still survives to this day. And that is pretty incredible. And he contributed to London and to England at an extraordinary level. He himself paid for the building of the bourse and founded the Royal Exchange, which allowed London to become a great place for finance, just as Antwerp was. London is still a great place for finance. Mm -hmm. He set it up to accommodate that. If it was called the Royal Exchange, he would, of course, had to have Elizabeth's okay for that. It wasn't like he could do that himself. He had to have her permission for all of those things. And I think it was one of the first, I don't want to say a mall, but it was a place where there was everything you wanted to buy was there. You have read stories about the ladies in waiting going there to buy things and have a nice day out at the mall. He did have this kind of stroke of idealism because he left money so that after he died, there would be money for a public lecture series. And he wanted this lecture series to be at the highest level, the greatest intellectuals of the time. And these people would read a lecture every day just for anyone. Mm -hmm. And they would read every day of the week. And that time it was Latin and religion and history. And the subjects have changed. But Gresham College, as it's called, it still exists. And Gresham College lectures go on. And they're remarkable. And they're available to everyone. Gresham College lectures are bigger than ever. They're science, ecology, history. Gresham wanted these lectures to be available to everyone. And he really put his money where his mouth was because... Now you can watch the Gresham College lectures from anywhere in the world because of YouTube. And Gresham did believe that anyone and everyone would be interested in hearing these lectures. And that's pretty, perhaps shockingly egalitarian of him. It was, but I think that he was like many, many successful people where he sort of was egalitarian to humanity as a whole and probably a real a-hole in dealing with individuals. <laughs> <laughs> He did not have a good reputation. <laughs> All of this economic activity would have been great for a business like Philomena's. After all, the more trade there is, the more people who visit, mm -hmm. the more people who need a place to stay. And the more money they have to spend when they are there. I guess the question is, could our Philomena keep her business? Well, her mother could. We can be fairly sure of that. Yes, because widows had the most autonomy, and there are lots of examples of that. One was a woman named Catherine Fenkill, whose husband had been a draper, and after he died, she took over the business, and she even had a fleet of ships that she managed, and those ships imported and exported her goods. Wow, so did she take over her husband's membership in the Draper's Guild? No, she wasn't part of the guild, but she still took on apprentices and she was invited to the Draper's Guildy get-togethers. Wow. The more you read about this period, you realize there were small numbers of people who had successful businesses outside of the guild and that there were a lot of interesting things going on in the margins. I mean, that's right. There was some flexibility in certain circumstances if things went your way, but it was certainly best to be part of the guild if you could manage it. It's also interesting because this is the time of 
religious reform and a lot of the new Protestant doctrine talked about commercially run practices being immoral. I mean, as a Catholic, Philomena doesn't have that idea. No, no. The the Catholics had the idea that leisure was good, but also opulence is good. The Protestants, though, were worried about the corruption and injustice that comes out of this rapidly rising middle class. I mean, then is now worries about money, how to spend it, corruption. It's gone on forever. So Philomena's mother could run the inn, but what about Philomena herself? What if she got married? She would lose everything. But actually, we don't want to overstate the freedoms women had, but some wives did have business enterprises separate from their husband. And there was kind of a custom in London. Which was a custom, not a law. That if a woman had a business on her own, and then if the husband wasn't really part of it, maybe he was in a different guild or did his own thing, and she was the responsible party, that they were still called femme souls, and they could trade under their own names. And they could enter contracts. And they could be sued. That's a lot of autonomy. Very high profile women did this. A Mildred Zessel had many private business ventures and she behaved in this way. She didn't ask Cecil's permission. But what's depressing and maybe counterintuitive is that as time passed, women had less autonomy. And finally, women had to have permission from their husbands to work at all. Even in this time period, because it's a custom and not a law, there's a lot of mushiness around what a woman might be allowed to do. For for instance, if you were sued and you got a judge, who of course was always a man, and he thought it was fine that you as a woman conducted your own business separate from your husband, then that was one thing. But if you got a judge that thought women should not be able to run a solo business, then it would not go well for you because there was no law to support you. If Philomena doesn't marry though, she will be able to run the business as a femme sole. That's true. And there were laws protecting women acting as a femme sole. I don't know what would happen if there was another claimant on the end, but she might not want to run the business on her own. Mm -hmm. Also, we think that kind of independence is so laudable, but I don't know if women in this time period would have thought so. No, like Constance, Philomena would probably have wanted children. Well, that's true. You know, one of the things that is so then is now about children is the debate about whether you should or shouldn't breastfeed. I mean, that has been going on forever. I know it. Judgy then, <laughs> judgy now. Our own Elizabeth Clinton told her daughter-in-law that she should have done it, but she didn't because it was too much trouble. Oh, Elizabeth Clinton wrote, it is so noisome to one's clothes and it makes one look old. <laughs> So she wasn't too sentimental about it, but she did think she should have done it. No, that's and unquestionably it, that her daughter. And she's should. right. It is noisome to one's clothes. She's <laughs> right about that. Our favorite debt avoiding princess was also not very sentimental. Cecilia. Yes, she's made it to her ship. But will she sail away without Constance? Will she put Constance back on shore? We will tell you in the next episode. Any adventure requires a little danger. And don't forget, tell a friend about our podcast. Yes, we would love that. Also, all our gratitude for listening. So join us next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk.